Welcome to King's Church this morning. It's a little bit Baltic in here. The heating has been on. It's just not particularly effective when it's so cold and it needs to try and defrost everything this morning. But we're, we're trusting that um, the Lord's going to warm us up from the inside this morning. So uh, <laughs> you have to sing up, dance around, do what you need to do to, to be warm this morning. But let's, uh, we welcome Ian, <laughs> Ian um, from Fullwood. Uh, this morning who's bringing the message and uh, your wife thank you very much for coming down this fine day and um, we're really excited this is our, our last last week of November which means next week is December which means Scott's start so on Tuesday Scott starts with us so next weekend we've got a very exciting service um, where we're uh, welcoming Scott and there's probably going to be a few more of us here to, to help us do that so we look forward to that. Um, that's, that's it from my side of announcements this morning. Um, before we get going, I think Andy has got a few words that he would like to say on behalf of uh, himself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Come up, Andy. <laughs> Take the pulpit. <laughs> It is. It's in my mind. How about now? No. And now? Shall I just speak up? Yeah. I can yeah, speak up. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we've not been here for a while. This has not been very well, so we've been uh, stay, staying at home. Um, so I was going to say some of what Jeff just said, but uh, so yes, as you know, um, Scott will start his post with us. It's actually this Wednesday, so it'll be the first. Um, so he, Jen, and the kids, they're not really kids now, but uh, Natalie, Andrew, and Sean, uh, they're going to be moving into their new house in Ellsmithport tomorrow and Tuesday. So uh, think of them, I'm sure it'll be a bit chaotic. And then um, next Sunday, we'll be formally uh, celebrating Scott joining us with an induction service. And that will be led by the Free Methodist National Leader. Um, that's John Townley. Some of you probably haven't met him. And uh, John will also be preaching. So it will be a good Sunday to attend. And after the service, we'll be having a sandwich uh, buffet. And so hopefully uh, everyone planning to stay has told Richard or Isabel, so there are no numbers, uh, for catering. And I hope you're able to join us. Um, on a more personal note, I'd like to share something. So, um, as you'll be aware, um, I was asked to join the leadership team to add my support when our previous pastor, Mansell, um, took a three-month sabbatical. Normally, leaders are voted in by the church partners, but we were in lockdown. It was pandemic time, so I just appeared on the scene. When Mansell returned and explained he wished to step down, I was asked by the leaders and John uh, to stay on in the role of the lay delegate to liaise closely with conference and oversee the appointment of our next pastor. I was uh, asked to oversee some of the work on the church building and the grounds as well. You may have noticed one or two uh, things taking place, particularly with the cabin. Um, but as Scott joins us this week on Wednesday, <laughs> I feel I can now step down as lay delegate and off the leadership team. So I'm now hoping to be free to explore some other uh, things on my heart. So it'll be an opportunity for the, for the partners of church to vote in the next lay delegate at some point in the new year. But I'm confident King's is now in good hands and Scott is the right man to take us forward. So on that note, I've got a card here. Um, the mean... The, I won't show it actually in case Scott is watching, but the picture on it, um, it will be meaningful to Scott. Okay, so it's just to welcome him and the family to Kings. So um, I'll leave that uh, at the front here. So do, do try and uh, write a message to welcome them to Kings. Um, I'm sure they'd love to uh, receive that. And I'll give that to him when I see him on Wednesday, because I'll be around just to help hand over things to him and so on. Um, 
And that's it really from me. Okay. Oh, bless you. Thank you, Andy. That's wonderful. Now we're really excited. So let's, let's stand and pray and then we'll, uh, we're going to spend a few, a few songs in worship warming up. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for each person who's been involved at King's and continues to be involved at King's Church here. <laughs> We, we're just so excited about what you've got planned for us for the future. We just rely so heavily on you and what you have got planned and on and, and your Holy Spirit to, to be with us and to guide us and to direct us and to give us the strength we need, Lord, to face the challenges that we're facing um, and, and, and we will face as, as we go forth. The, the climate out there is not, not easy with lockdowns and other things and viruses and winds and things that are going on around us. And, we could wake up in the morning and so easily just feel overwhelmed with everything that's going on. We know, though, that when we put our trust in you, when we, when we lay our heart bare before you and say, just use us, Lord, the way you want to use us, we know that you give us the strength. Your Holy Spirit comes into us and gives us everything we need, all the food we need, both spiritually and, and physically, Lord, that we need in order to progress with you. And this morning, we, we, we lift up our hearts. We do exactly that. We, we put them down bare before you. And we just ask you, Lord, just use us. Come into us. Take away all the noise of life that is around us. And make us the people that, that you know that we are, that you made us to be, that we so, so sometimes just can't see who we are, Lord, because of the noise around us. So let's do that this morning. Let's lay down the noise and let's just come to God, who we are. Amen, amen.
my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. be in us. Father, this morning, as, as, <clears throat> as we hear your word, open our hearts, open our minds, so that we can hear you, and not, that, not the other voices that are in our heads. We pray that as Ian comes up, you bless him, you anoint him, let your Holy Spirit speak through him and be with him this morning. Amen, amen, amen. Would you like to take your seat? Thanks, Ian. <coughs> Morning, everybody. Good to be with you this morning. For those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Ian Clarkson. I'm currently acting lead pastor at Forward Free Methodist Church in Preston. Um, I was just talking to some of the guys earlier, and um, I've actually slept on this church floor a number of times. Um, one time was a group of us decided it would be a really good idea to try and cycle from Preston down to Cornwall. Uh, for charity, and this was our first stop, um, so I was very thankful for that. Um, if I'd have known at that point how far and how hard it was going to be, I think I would have turned back from here and gone straight back home. Um, but also, just you know, this as, as I come to bring God's word to you this morning, um, it's been an interesting year for us. Well, in that interesting couple of years, hasn't it, for everybody in terms of being church and what that actually looks like. But also for us at Forward in this last 12 months or so in particular, we've been looking at who's going to be our next senior pastor. And I know you, I know you guys have you've actually beaten us to it. We've been in the process longer, but you've managed to, to sort it out a lot quicker than we have. Um, but also in the midst of all that, just as in April as we were starting to get things back up and running, we had a couple of weddings uh, were going to happen in the building and things were starting to move forward. There was a terrible accident within the church and a guy actually fell through the, the, the main worship area ceiling seven and a half meters straight down onto the floor. So we had to close our main worship area for a number of months uh, and went through a whole health and safety thing as well, which is still ongoing. Um, but we've managed to get back in and worship together. And so when, as, I, as I was thinking about what to share with you today, and I recognize I'm the warm-up act for next week, in many ways, and hopefully a warm-up act for you today, because you're all sitting here going like that. And if you're sitting at home, you're in, you're in a good place, but come and huddle with these people next week. Um, so I did mention to John, I said, um, I'm your warm-up act, and I also had a word with Scott at a recent retreat, uh, and said, what would you like me to say? And he said, oh, there's lots of things. Um, he said, speak God's word. So hopefully what I bring to you today is something of what God might be wanting to say to each of us uh, as individuals, but also as a church today. So I just want us to read from Habakkuk chapter 3, from verse 1. Uh, it's in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. Um, and it's a prayer that Habakkuk says. So reading from verse 1, it says this, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigayanoth. 
Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed up from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the old, age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with the horse, your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow, you called for many arrows, you split the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by, the deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of the wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and the, my legs trembled. Yet... I will wait patiently for the, lo the day of the calamity to come on the nations invading us. Though the fig trees do not, does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will, I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Here reads God's word this morning. So I want to start with a question. And what the question is this, what's the most difficult experience you have had to weather in your life so far? And I don't need you to shout out an answer, but just think about that for a moment. What events wrenched you emotionally the most? I'm sure each and every one of us can think of a moment, whether we're sat here in church this morning or sat at home. For, for some of you, it might be the death of a loved one, a spouse. It might be of a child or of a parent. It might be an act of violence committed against you. It might be something physical or something emotional. It might be that you feel that you've been ignored. Nobody is listening to your voice. You may be feeling rejected or put down by someone that you love. Or maybe it's the consequences of your own actions. But think back. At that time, what were your thoughts towards God at that difficult time in your life? Did you pray in that time? And if so, how? Was it with tears? Was it with anger? Was it with a broken heart? So as we've read, we're looking this today in the book of Habakkuk, which contains words, I think, of great hope. As it started out, I felt like I needed to give you a warning that it, it's quite difficult at the beginning, but it gets better towards the end. But I don't think we can understand these verses that we've read today unless we understand the depth of despair that faced the prophet as he's writing them and as he's saying this prayer. You see, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. The book was probably written somewhere between 609 and 605 BC. And in, this is a time of major upheaval for the people. Assyria, the major world power that had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel about 100 years previously, has recently fallen. And now there's a power struggle starting up. The Babylonians or Chaldeans are beginning to look threatening and are flexing their muscles. And at the same time, Egypt has come out from under Assyrian domination and is now starting to flex their 
muscles again and thinking of themselves once more as a major world power that can start to rebuild its kingdom. And the southern kingdom of Judah has had a mixture of good and bad th- kings in the previous century. But nevertheless, it's a nation that's filled with corruption. Habakkuk has also asked questions of God, many of which could have started with, why? Why are these things happening? Habakkuk sees God as a consuming fire. He's pure and he's holy. And in chapter 1 of Habakkuk, he calls out, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you don't save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? This was written thousands of years ago, but I think could still speak into our situation we find ourselves today. But by 3.16, he's, he, seems, he sees the enormity of that punishment, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and he trembles. As we read in verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. See, Habakkuk is writing about 18 to 20 years before Jerusalem is destroyed. And quite possibly he's alive when that destruction takes place. He may, not, he may have been killed in the battle or he may have starved during the siege. Or he may actually have survived it and lived through it. We don't know. But we know that the prophet Jeremiah experienced all the terrors of that time as well. See, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon surrounds the city and he besieges it for two whole years. He's starving the people into submission. And eventually the king of Judah and his army tried to escape through a hole in the wall at night. But they were caught and slaughtered. The Babylonians then enter the city. They're looting, they're murdering, they're plundering and destroying And I think this is probably the worst type of of, of situation any person alive could ever experience. Remember, Habakkuk foresees the events that are going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. And later, Jeremiah describes the horror for us. It's starvation of young and old, cannibalism of children, the destruction of Solomon's temple, the apparent end of his country. And seeing this, Habakkuk writes in 3, 17, 19, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, there could be no cattle in the stalls. And so in many ways, it's writing about, I've lost everything. Everything has gone. See, the economy of Judah at this time is based almost exclusively on the agriculture and livestock. And uh, agriculture could be divided into permanent crops, the fruit trees, the olive trees, the grapevines, and the annual field crops like wheat and barley, with cattle and sheep in addition. According to this verse, every part of the economy has failed. Do you see what he's saying? Even though I've lost everything... Even though all my income disappears, we might put it differently. Because I don't know how many of us are fruit growers or agriculturalists or uh, have cattle. We might then say, when I lose my job, when the benefits don't come or run out, when I can't work, when I'm denied my disability claim, When the bills come in, but there's no money coming into my account. When the debts are mounting up. But really, Habakkuk's situation is worse than anything we can imagine in this country at this time. For in Judah, there was no social services agency. There's no homeless shelters. There's no food banks for them to turn to. They're surrounded, they're cut off, and this enemy is coming in and looting and destroying them. There's no well-off relatives they can turn to. 
No income for Habakkuk means starvation. It means death. First for the weakest in the family, the old and the young, and eventually for everyone. Now, I doubt any of us here this morning or at home has ever faced the genuine prospect of having a family member starve to death because of a lack of income. But that's, that's possibly what Habakkuk faced and many were facing and many are facing in the world today. They are facing starvation. But don't let the extremity of these circumstances blind you to the relevance for us today. Another way to think of this verse, which perhaps is easier for us to relate to, is though, though it looks like all God's gifts have been taken from me. Because how often do we actually call out to God to give us things to give us what we need or we think we need at the time, or maybe even for our wants and desires. But how does Habakkuk respond to this situation? What we see is a man who rejoices in the midst of extreme trials and draws out some lessons for us today by living faith, by living by faith digging deeper into his relationship with God. And I think we've got some things we can learn today as well. Because he says, yet. Many times during the Psalms as well, it talks about the calamities and the difficulties, and then it talks about yet God is, or yet God will. And Habakkuk does the same. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like the, the feet of a deer and makes me walk on high places. There are three reactions Habakkuk avoids as he speaks these words out. He does not lash out at God in anger. Have you ever lashed out at God in anger? Even this week, I had a good old moan and a grumble at God one morning. I was having a proper old rant at him. And as I went out to my car, and often when I do this, this is one of the strange things that happens. And maybe it's a coincidence, but maybe it's God just going, I'll show him. Whenever I've had a good old rant at God in the morning, and I've gone out and I'm walking towards, because my, my house is only just around the corner from, from uh, the church, as I've walked up the road, there are times where I've suddenly heard a noise, and it's the noise of geese in the sky. Now, normally what happens is when I see these geese, there's only a small flock, about eight or nine of them, and they're flying usually south past my house or over, you know, over the house, and I go, okay, God, yeah, I get it. Because yeah. I'm, I'm into this whole thing as well of you know, the community of Iona, their, their, thing, uh, their symbol for the Holy Spirit is a wild goose. And so I kind of connect with that in some way. And I go, okay, God, yeah, you're, you're telling me you're still here, that your Holy Spirit wants to work with me. Okay, fine. Eight or nine geese, yeah, okay, I get it. Well, this morning, this week, as I'm having a good old rant at God, as I'm locking the door and I hear these geese, I, I look at them and I think, yeah, I'm going to see about eight or nine geese. And yeah, okay. And they'll be flying over. Yeah, I get it. Hmm, there was about 80 or 90 geese flying in a huge V. And they weren't flying the usual direction they usually fly. Instead of flying south, the point of the V was pointing directly to where our church is. And I went, okay, I get the message. I'll crack on, I'll do what I've got to do today. I'll keep going, I will persevere. Habakkuk doesn't say, you, God, you have no right to destroy your people. You are a faithless God. He doesn't say that. He doesn't cry out in anger. He just questions why. Why are these things happening? He doesn't even pretend that evil will not happen. He knows that it is evil in the world. It's outside the gates of the city. He just needs to stand on the city walls and look out. They're surrounded. They're surrounded for two years. He doesn't withdraw into a fantasy world saying, that's too terrible to think about. 
I'll close my eyes and think of something lovely. I'll, or, and, you know, in, in our day, we might go, I'll sit in front of the TV and get distracted. I'll find something to escape so I don't have to deal with the reality of my situation. He stands there and he goes, I know the reality of the situation, but I know my God is bigger and he is greater. And he doesn't say, despite all this, I will endure you know, as we might say in this country, oh, I'll keep the good old stiff British upper lip. I'll just keep smiling my way through it. I'll stick it out. I'll persevere. I'll still wait for the Lord. I will remain faithful. Habakkuk not only foresees the possibility that he could and probably will lose everything, he foresees the certainty that the world as he knows it, along with everything and everyone he loves, is probably going to be destroyed terribly. That's his reality. And in this extremity, he not only says, I won't accuse God of being unfaithful to me, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. How can he say that? Looking ahead to the terrors of Nebuchadnezzar's siege, how can Habakkuk rejoice when faced with all this before him? Do that and say, I will rejoice. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. He answers it in verse 19 because he recognises that God's led him here as well. He says, the Lord God is my strength. He holds firmly to that belief where he's weak, God is strong. He has made my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me walk on high places. And I think this explains why Habakkuk can actually rejoice in the midst of all he's about to face. He says, he's made my feet like the feet of a deer. I don't know when was the last time you climbed up a mountain, but there's, you know, as you're climbing up or walking up um, seemingly inaccessible peaks, rocks to a deer with the way its feet have been made can climb to the uppermost crags, can run over rock fields as easily as we would run on a beach. Because of their feet, their tough cloven hooves, deer aren't hurt by those sharp rocks, but are able to grip even small outcrops. God has designed them for climbing. They don't slip, they don't fall. So Habakkuk rejoices that God helps him over the difficult ground of his life, as though he was a deer. And then he talks about my high places. I'm sure many of us during all the lockdowns and everything else probably went for walks and stuff and I don't know whether you got to any high places but I love to get to a high place sometimes because it gives you a different viewpoint. It gives you a different perspective on things. You experience a great view, you exercise your body, you get back to nature. Um, my eldest son over the summer decided, um, well, he's applying for the RAF and he... Um, he needed, they said he needs to do more outdoor activity. Well, how do you do outdoor activity in the middle of lockdowns? He decided to go and climb the Yorkshire Three Peaks and then the National Three Peaks. Um, he decided to do the Yorkshire one with less than 24 hours notice. I'm like, okay, you don't just go, drive yourself up there. Your mum's going to be worried. I'm going to be worried. I'll come with you. And I thought, I'll see how many I can do myself. And after about 10 minutes of walking with him, I went, son, you just go do your thing. It's going to take me a little bit longer to get even up the first one. And by the time I got to the top of the first one, he was nearly at the top of the second. And I was like, forget it. I'm going back to the car to have a pot noodle. And that's what I did. Um, but even, you know... And the amazing thing was the cloud just, as I got to the summit, because someone was like, oh, the view from this first one's amazing. And I went, I'll, I'll be there, I'll be there soon, son. And I got to the top, it was completely cloudy, couldn't see a thing. But on those beautiful days when you get up there and you can see, 
But this is, you know, this is a very much a 19th, 20th, 21st century idea to actually go up, climbing up a mountain for fun, for, for, the, for the view. In Habakkuk's day, no one exercised for the sake of exercise. Mountain climbing for fun was still a few thousand years in the future. And instead, in this culture, the high places implies those places that are difficult to get to, those challenging places, a place you wouldn't go unless it was really, really necessary. You might climb to a high place to gain defendable ground in a battle, but you only go there if you can't avoid it. So high places here means difficult and challenging places. Or to put it another way, he leads me to those high places. He makes me go there even though I don't want to. Or it might mean he enables me to walk on places I couldn't go without his help. But also high places are the places where people would often go to meet with God himself. A mountaintop was a point at which God could meet with Moses. But Moses had to climb the mountain to be able to get into the presence of God. And I think both of those ideas are present here. Habakkuk is not talking about a pleasant afternoon of rock climbing. He dreads what God has in store for him. He knows the path is very challenging, very dangerous. In other words, God's leading him to a place he doesn't want to go to. But he knows that he's not walking it on his own. God is his strength. And Habakkuk is confident that God will enable him to do what he could never do on his own. And God will be with him, even in the most difficult circumstances of his life. So why rejoice? Rejoice because God is good. Because God is wise. Because God's in control. And he knows what he's doing and he wants to meet with us in those difficult and challenging places. He wants us to know that we can fully rely on him. And for us today, that might mean loving God himself instead of the things that we want him to do. See, Habakkuk sees all God's gifts disappear. Now, the question for him is, Will he love God himself for who he is, not what he provides? Do you see the difference? There's a big difference between I love you because you've done this for me and actually just saying, God, I love you no matter what happens to me in my situation. One is reliant on, well, I love you because you're going to give me something. The other is, It's our relationship with each other. That I will love you because I have a relationship with you as my Lord and my Saviour. Living by faith means loving God himself for himself. Yes, we need to be thankful for his gifts, but God should be our delight. Because God is our portion. He is our treasure And nothing you desire compares to knowing him for yourself. And we can know him today because he has given us the greatest gift of all. That is his son, Jesus Christ. That's how much he wants to be in relationship with you and me. So how many times do we actually start saying, God, I love you because we've asked him for something and we've not got it. We've asked him to do something in a situation and he's not done it. Hear Habakkuk saying, because of who he is, I will rejoice. Not because he's going to save my people. Not because he's bringing in someone to sort out the Babylonians. He's saying, I will rejoice in God because of who he is. Because of my relationship with him. So where are you right now? What are you facing right now? Are you able to say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Because God wants you to dig deeper into your relationship with him and to put your trust in him and keep doing that and keep deepening that relationship. 
whatever your high places today might be, those challenging places that you've looked to, know that God is the one who guides you there, but will also walk with you there. He will enable you to endure. He will enable you to rejoice. Will you trust in him? Will you delight in him? Will you dig deeper into your relationship with him through prayer and reading his word? Will you, like Habakkuk, when it feels like everything is surrounding you, throw yourself upon him? Will you love him with all your heart? Will you love him with all your soul? Will you love him with all your mind and with all your strength? I'm going to invite the the band up. And I don't know what you're facing at the moment. I don't know where you're at. But I would just wonder if we just take a couple of moments. Just think about the things that are going on in your life right now. Whether you're sat here or whether you're sat at home. I'm sure there's difficult places that we can all think of. There are situations that maybe you've been praying to God for so long. That you've been asking and crying out to God. And it feels like he's not answering Will you today, like Habakkuk, still be able to say, yet, yet, I will rejoice in God my Lord. I will stand with him. Though I don't get what I need, though things seem to be running out, the sovereign Lord is my strength. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Let's pray together. Lord God, we've read this prayer of Habakkuk this morning and Lord, he he lays it on the line. He knows the difficulties that are facing him. And yet, he places his whole self, his whole trust in you. And he says, I'm not just going to put up with this and just have a moan to you, God. He says, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Lord, you know where each and every one of us is today. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, whatever we're facing right now, would know your presence with us. Lord, that from the deepest uh, parts of our being, we would still call out to you. Lord, that we wouldn't be angry. Lord, we wouldn't actually say, well, if only God would do this then I will be more uh, willing to serve him. But that we would be people who would be willing to say and be able to say from the bottom of our hearts, though nothing seems to be working, though nothing seems to be going my way, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that through the Holy Spirit, you give us the strength that we need. You give us the gifts that we need to help us every single day. Lord, may we completely and utterly rely on you as our Lord and Saviour. We ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Yeah, and just before, um, just before we start worship, uh, you know, Rebecca and uh, Rob... Uh, that are usually here. He's got an uncanny resemblance um, to Abraham Lincoln, actually. But uh, other than that, uh, Rebecca's aunt is very poorly in uh, hospital with pneumonia on both lungs, and they've asked and expressly asked for us to pray for her. Um, she said that she doesn't want putting on um, some kind of cyst, you know, b- help breathing. She wants to trust in the Lord, which is a wonderful thing, but the family are concerned that she might perish because of that. So it's a confusing time for them, and she's very ill. So let's pray um, now. I pray, Lord God, that you supernaturally bring a a right decision into that um, situation, that uh, you heal Maureen, and that you you fully restore her and, um, and show your miracles, Father God, through this. Heavenly Father, whilst so many people are are struggling with breathing problems due to COVID, this is horrendous and the the family must be going through um, real real pressure. So, 
Soothe them with your peace, Lord God. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Amen. Would you like to stand? Father, as as we come to you this, this, this morning, still the morning, we offer ourselves to you again. We, um, we'd like to just respond to that message that we've heard this morning. We, we, we love you because of who you are. It's great when, when you bless us as well. But we, we just love you for who you are, Lord. We praise you. And we lift up your name this morning. Amen.
in your hands Lord we're in the right place and we can take comfort in knowing that all will be well with our soul Lord Jesus Splendor of the King. 
us to praise you and to glorify you and to give you the ev- everything Lord Jesus give you everything that we are as we go out amen amen thank you for joining us this week and um, look forward to seeing you again next week amen <laughs>